So back to my questions. So does depredation matter, matter for stock status? And that's what everybody's been talking about. Um, so stock assessment 101, I guess. Um, we're all, with all these fisheries, we've got some sort of harvest strategy that we're looking at. Um, so I'm not sure about exactly what the objectives for, I know what the objectives are for Camelar fisheries. They're the ones that I'm most familiar with. And also for Australian domestic uh, fisheries, we have harvest strategies. And you know, your basic harvest strategy is that you want to make sure that there's enough fish left after you've been fishing to make sure that they breed and there's, there's recruitment and so on. And so um, you see a lot of what's called a max MSY approach, so you know, maximum sustainable yield. But sort of the state of the art for um, many, many years is that we want to have some sort of ecosystem-based harvest strategy. So we're not just trying to maximise the yield from the stock we're interested in. We also want to make sure that because toothfish do other things apart from just hanging around waiting to be caught, um, they're eating um, prey and they're being eaten by things. And so they exist in an ecosystem, so we want to make sure that enough of them escape the fishery to do the things that they're supposed to be doing in the ecosystem. So there's many cases in the past where you have um, problems. If you take a predator-like toothfish out of the system completely, then you're going to have the release of that the predation that they were doing on whatever they eat, and so you may cause problems like proliferation of um, um, prey species that you don't want. And similarly, we want to make sure that things like sperm whales and, and elephant seals that naturally eat toothfish aren't going to starve to death. I mean, I think they're important, and they're actually part of Camelar's objectives and also part of Australian legislation that we have to consider the ecosystem that, that the fishery is in. Um, and you would be familiar with your own controlling legislation. In most cases, I think um, countries have some sort of legislation that mandates they have to uh, have to do that these days. And then, so the policy sort of has these abstract statements in it, like you know, fish sustainably. And then stock assessment scientists have to come up with some sort of implementation of that. So you can see here, this is how Camelot implements. Um, Article 2, which is uh, the part of the Camelot Convention that says make sure there's enough recruitment, make sure that the ecosystem isn't too impacted. And what we do is make sure that at least half of the stock escapes in the long term. And also, um, because there's uncertainty in the exact trajectory of the stock, we make sure that, that there's a less than 10% chance that the stock is at less than 20% of its initial state at any time during the the, um, the fishery. So here's an example of a, an output from a, a stock assessment. So you start off um, with some sort of hypothetical unfished state, gets fished down, and then you, you reach today, and then you go forward. But of course, you know, they're, they're just models. So if we imagine, I mean, it's a photograph, but in reality, you know, there's this dude with a beard, and we're trying to model him. So, um, you know, we come up with what we think is a nice sketch that character captures all the characteristics of, of the bearded man. Um, but in actual fact, we're probably only achieving uh, a pretty poor cartoon of, um, of what we're trying to represent. But as, um, as uh, Marta said, um, you know, in, in some respects we're trying to come up with the simplest explanation for the, the phenomena that we're interested in. We don't necessarily have to include everything that's going on in the system as long as we make sure that the decisions that we're making are robust to um, the uncertainty we have around those sorts of things. So the essentials for a stock assessment are some sort of index of abundance. Um, and that is really, really difficult to get because if you look out the window, you can't actually count the fish. You know, they're, they're hiding in the water. Um, so people use surveys. Um, we use tag recaptures increasingly in Camelar because um, we've learnt over time that things like CPUE time series are quite problematic to analyse. And that's because um, there's no way of ground truthing your catch rate. They're, they're a good indicator in the long term of how the stock might be performing in a relative sense, but it doesn't tell you absolutely how much fish is in the water. 
And the issue with depredation is, is that if you're using a purely CPUE-based model, then there can actually be an incentive to over-report depredation because that will give the impression that there were much more fish in the water than there might have been. So, you know, you will say, well, our CPUE was really low, but that's because the, the, there were so many whales stealing so many fish, there's, there's heaps of fish out there, everything's fine. So, um, CPUE is actually quite problematic, but we all still use it in some sense because there is some logical appeal to the idea that if you catch more fish and you catch them faster, there must be more fish out there. But um, it, it can actually be quite difficult to interpret. Um, and then within all stock assessments, there's some sort of population dynamics model. So here we've just got sort of two life stages in, in, a, in a fish. So you have the spawning stock and then you have the recruits and they're spawning stocks producing recruits and the recruits are then growing up and, and maturing. And there's all these processes that are going on, you know, you can imagine there's spawning and then so some fish spawn, some fish don't, sometimes the eggs and sperm get together, sometimes they don't. Then the larvae and eggs are distributed around in the ocean by currents and wind and then they've got to find food and then they've got to grow and some die because of disease or they starve to death and then they've got to find habitat to settle and then they become a recruit. And then once they're a recruit they'll move around and, you know, some of them mature early, some of them mature late, and some of them die from natural causes or, you know, disease or eaten by things and, and all that sort of stuff. They've got to find food and so on and so on. But our stock, actual stock assessment model ignores all of the stuff on that other side because it's too complicated and pretty much just models the growth, mortality and maturation of the, um, the things that we can observe. So again, it's a, it's a fairly crude cartoon of, of what's actually happening in the world, but um, you know, this is what we're using to, to try and manage these stocks. So that's why it's important to, to be upfront about the fact that we, there's uncertainty about a lot of these processes. And then on the side you have some sort of fisheries model. So you're trying to, to estimate what the removals by the fishery are of this population um, by age and, and sex, if that's important. And so here's your entire stock assessment model and, and in some, some way you're going to try and fit that to the data that you're observing. So you're trying to get a model that's consistent with your observations of all of these different things. And so as I said, you know, this is how we implement it in Camel A. Go from unfished, there's a fish down phase, you reach um, now and you can see that in this particular instance we're actually quite certain about the catch history. This is Heard Island, so we, we're quite lucky. We've always had observers, we've always had log books, so um, we're quite fortunate in being reasonably certain about what the historical state of the stock has been. But then as you go forward, because things like recruitment and that become is unpredictable, um, you start to get this increasing uncertainty as to what the future state of the stock's going to be. And so you have some projection um, mechanism to try and incorporate that uncertainty, ideally. But then which bits of this system are affected by depredation? Well, so I would say all the things in black, so the mortality um, is in some respects um, influenced by depredation and predation. And then catch at age, catch rates, all the things we've talked about it could be impacted. So how do we, you know, we've talked about the specific instances again, but just trying to think about some way that you could generically incorporate um, what's going on into your stock assessment and got this idea about talking about um, the different organisms doing things in, in two different ways when they're depredating. So there's, what I would say is organisms that would naturally be eating the toothfish anyway but the fisheries facil facilitating that. So, you know, the ones that I showed you yesterday, colossal squid, they're eating toothfish ordinarily. Um, the sleeper sharks, sperm whales, orcas in some circumstances. But then there's other things that you could call opportunistic. So they're ones that are, are getting the toothfish just because they're constrained on the bottom in your, on your long line. So um, this might be some way that you could start to categorise or, or split apart those um, types of depredation that are going on. And you may have organisms that are in both categories. So for example, orcas may um, in some circumstances be eating toothfish in shallow water, but then when the the long line boat comes along, they're also using that as a, as, a, as a lazy way of getting hold of fish. 
And so splitting these, these things apart, and I mean, we've heard some good examples about how people are approaching this, but if you look, think about the facilitated um, depredation as being pretty much part of the natural mortality um, function in your, in your stock assessment. Um, but I think what we need now is to get a better understanding about things like the, the if we call them facilitated predators, are they eating more toothed fish than they would have ordinarily done? So there's a question that a scientist can go out and work on. But then the opportunistic ones, they're effectively like, you know, illegal fishes or another fleet. So you, you put them in as, you know, taking their own catch with their own selectivity and so on. So that might be a way that you could um, separate apart those two different processes and incorporate them into stock assessments. Um, that's all I've got now, and this is my last talk, so you won't have to see me up here again, but I am going to chair the discussion now.